Okay. So if you look at the situation of white artisans in the urban north, you know, now you know what their grievances were, how their workplace was changing. Now we're going to be looking at a completely different group of workers, but who are also workers in this period, enslaved people. And uh, their enslavers, the way in which they um, kind of created a, an oppressive, oppressive workplace for their enslaved workforce. Um, these are not occupational portraits. These are just portraits. Uh, one of the things that the Historic American Building Survey has done, this is a, an arm of the federal government associated with the Smithsonian Institution that goes around surveying historic American buildings. They um, collected architectural drawings of the cabins that enslaved people lived in on plantations during slavery times. So this gives you an idea of how small and basic these kinds of cabins of enslaved people were. It's interesting that this particular um, cabin has a chimney in the middle of it. I think that would have been kind of unusual because chimneys caught on fire quite a bit in this period. So it was more usual to have a chimney at the end of the building so that it could be knocked down if it caught on fire and not catch the rest of the building on fire. Okay, so this right here is a picture of a big piece of pottery that was created by an enslaved potter in the 19th century, a guy named Dave. Dave is interesting because he not only made beautiful pots that are quite huge, he threw them on a wheel. So he must have been like an enormous guy with really big hands and a lot of strength to be able to control the clay. But he also signed his work, he dated it, and he sometimes put in little rhymes about whoever it was going to or what it was um, that he was thinking that day. His pieces have become major collector items on the antiques market. And the point of me showing you this is to say the kinds of work that enslaved people did on plantations was extremely diverse. Because there was not really the presence of artisans in plantation areas, uh, enslaved people became artisans, but they did all kinds of other jobs too. Every kind of job that was done in the industrial north or the pre-industrial north was done by somebody who was enslaved in the South. The majority of enslaved people were field hands working in farm fields from dawn until dusk. That was the length of the workday. From can see in the morning to can't see in the evening with about an hour taken for lunch. They did this backbreaking work, which included things like picking cotton or uh, transplanting rice in rice paddies uh, or growing tobacco. They did this work under the supervision of a black or a white overseer who was armed with a whip and whose job it was to make sure that all of the people who were working in the field stayed on task. It was enormously hard work on the body. Um, people who did this kind of work aged very quickly. And they passed the time by singing songs or uh, talking to each other, just whatever they could do to kind of get through, get through the day. So imagine, if you will, having to do that kind of work day in and day out and receiving no pay for it. That is what it was like to be enslaved. Not all African enslaved people were field hands. Many were domestic servants. Domestic servitude, historians are finding more and more, 
was also a stage that many people passed through in their early teens, although some women remained domestic servants their entire lives. And the domestic servant's job was to live in the plantation owner's house and be at that person's beck and call. Every kind of job that you could imagine being done in an English aristocratic home, shining shoes, cooking, washing pans, um, taking out full, um, what do you call those things? Chamber pots, doing the washing, making the beds, cleaning the house, all of this was done by enslaved um, African Americans. If you were a field hand, at night you went back to sleep in the slave quarter where you would um, have the other enslaved people to talk to, you might have your family there, um, you would be cooking your own food, it would not be very tasty food probably because the best ingredients were not given to the enslaved people to make food out of, but at least you had the community around you to socialize with. If you were a um, domestic servant, you slept on the floor in the master's house, you had no time of your own, you had nobody in particular to be friends with, you got cast off clothing and cast off food from the family because you were expected to wait at table if the family ever entertained guests. But, you know, it was a different kind of hardship, still hardship. In addition to field labor and domestic labor, all kinds of artisanal labor was done by enslaved people. Um, they made bricks, they constructed houses, they made furniture, they sewed clothing, they made pottery, they made shoes, they made barrels. And these kinds of skills were passed on just like artisanal skills were in the North, you know, from older worker to younger worker, although there weren't formal apprenticeships. And then finally, some enslaved people worked in industrial settings or in mining. There were enslaved people working on turpentine farms in North Carolina. They were working in salt mines. They were working in coal mines. A lot of the enslaved people, they were working in iron forges. If you owned a person, you could rent them out. If you, let's say, didn't need them, but there was an industrial concern that needed some workforce, you would sign some paperwork to rent out the person for a stint of time in, um, in exchange for which you would get a certain wage that was paid to you, the owner, rather than being paid to the enslaved person. If that person was injured or killed, the person who rented the enslaved person owed the owner of the enslaved person money, just like if you rented a car and wrecked it, you would owe money to Enterprise. Okay. Questions so far? All right. As an enslaved person, you were not the owner of your own body. Your body was owned by the person who had paid money for your for yourself. You weren't allowed to leave. You weren't allowed to choose uh, where you're going to go on any particular day. And this meant that your owner was free to punish you corporately. Now I mentioned the whip. Of course, that was a form of discipline that was used quite a bit, um, not just to punish slaves who were thought to have broken some unwritten or written code, but also to get people to work faster. There was a feeling that everybody had a maximum work speed at which they could, let's say, pick cotton or grow tobacco or um, process sugar cane. And if you weren't keeping up with that, you would be whipped. In addition to whippings, um, another form of discipline was for families to be sold or separated from each other. 
Um, sometimes this wasn't even a form of discipline. Sometimes this was just something that happened in the normal course of a plantation owner's life. Um, a plantation owner or somebody would pass away. They would have some slaves that were in their ownership. During the probate process, those enslaved people would be sold or distributed to other family members. So um, family separation was a form of discipline. And there were other incidents of torture that were mentioned. Harriet Jacobs, as you will see, described the way in which a runaway on a neighboring plantation was punished. His master locked him inside the mechanism of a cotton gin, a space of only a couple of square feet, for several days without any food or water, and he was chewed to death by rats. If enslaved people were killed, there wasn't any legal recourse, since a black person's testimony was not considered in a court of law. So unless you could find some white person who had actually witnessed another white person killing the slave, there was not going to be any punishment for that murder or torture. Female slaves or women were in a terrible bind. On the one hand, they might be really, really pressured by their masters to agree to have uh, sex with them. But on the other hand, if they got pregnant and bore children, they would um, face a terrible situation with the wives, the master and wife on the plantation. Um, White women in slaveholding families were in this weird situation where often children would be born who everybody knew were the master's children born to one of the slaves, but everybody had to pretend that it wasn't his child because those children would be enslaved themselves, they would work in the fields. You know, everybody pretended that they didn't see what was going on. Um, Harry Jacobs, of course, as you're going to see, experiences this very situation. Okay, so this is very grim, but I do want to tell you about the way in which enslaved people were able to carve out a kind of sphere of autonomy for themselves. That is, even within the extremely punitive, terrible, horrible institution of slavery. Through a great deal of struggle, the Black community was able to persist, and some of the ways in which they did this involved holding on to their culture. So marriages were possible among enslaved people, and they were really um, encouraged by slave owners, but they were not the same kinds of marriages that white people were allowed to contract because these marriages were often matches made by the slave owner who wanted to make sure that children were born. So he would just say, okay, you're gonna be married to this person. Sometimes the husband and the family would live on a neighboring plantation and only see his family once a week on Sundays. Often families did not, um, were not able to stay together long enough to see children grow to adulthood, or children were taken away and sold or distributed to other people while they were still very young. So people's uh, families kind of easily disintegrate under this sort of pressure. To deal with that, African Americans came up with what historians call fictive kin relationships, that is, they made family-type relationships among people who were not otherwise related. Everybody in a particular plantation was responsible for overseeing every child. You've heard the expression, it takes a village. It's kind of like that. All of the women on the plantation were referred to as aunt whatever by the children. All of the Men, adult men, were referred to as uncle whatever by the children. And in this way, even if you didn't have your actual parents, you did have these 
sort of pretend relationships, these adults that you could count on to create a sense of community and make sure that you were okay. Enslaved people also had their own rites of passage. So when a baby was born, it was not the parents' um, choice what the baby was going to be named. That was the master's choice. And masters chose names for enslaved people that were different from the names that they would choose from their, for their own family members. They chose names that were more like names that you give to pet animals on the one hand, or in a kind of ironic joking manner, they would choose names of famous historical figures like Cato, Caesar, Brutus. I mean, you had a lot of enslaved people named after famous figures from ancient Rome, but it's kind of a joke. Um, however, people would have a private name that was given to them by their parents and might be an African word, might be a a grandfather's name might be a day of the week in an African language. So people having two names was a way of the Black community kind of trying to perpetuate African culture. Marriage customs were invented by Black communities on plantations. Maybe they couldn't actually have a marriage ceremony out of the Book of Common Prayer, but they could get together and jump over a broom onto the threshold of their new cabin. Courting rituals were also culturally specific. So if you gave somebody a wooden spoon, that was a way of proposing to them. And then finally, in old age, um, enslaved people had a different task on the plantation. They, when they were too old to work in the fields, would be in charge of watching the younger children or cooking. There was a lot of respect for elders in the community, people who did manage to live past the very short lifespan of field workers. And when they died, they would be buried in um, like a Christian burial uh, a Christian burial ceremony, but also perhaps with African um, cultural aspects. So people would leave goods on the grave for the person to use in the afterlife or bury them in the grave with the person, little trinkets and personal belongings. They would leave things like food or um, drink for the person who had died they would go into the woods and sing songs or um, sometimes play drums, uh, which were part of African cultural uh, traditions. So all of these rites of passage were ways in which enslaved people kind of secretly carved out a sphere of uh, autonomy for themselves in a very oppressive system. When Enslaved people were first brought over. There were a lot of Muslims among them because Islam had really um, spread all throughout West Africa in the centuries leading up to the initiation of the transatlantic slave trade. So there were some people who were Muslim. There were also some people who believed in animist religions, a sort of um, imbuing of natural world objects with different uh, religious personalities sort of thing. After a while, uh, slave owners wanted to convert their enslaved people to Christianity because it was no longer a question whether or not you could um, keep a Christian enslaved. That was okay. But enslaved people had their own form of Christianity that when they could practice it was very different from the emphasis that was placed by slave owners. Slave owners had a few favorite tropes from the Bible that they really harped on, like the story of the descendants of Ham in, in the Noah story, or slaves obey your masters, which is part of the Bible somewhere. 
In contrast, enslaved people would kind of appoint their own preachers who would preach to them secretly, mostly from the book of Exodus. That was their favorite book of the Bible. Why would that be? Because the Israelites were slaves. Yes. And they escaped with the help of God. So Exodus um, was the favorite book of the Bible for enslaved people and many of the spirituals um, that they came up with to sing also came out of either Exodus or elsewhere in the Old Testament. All right, so they did have their own religious customs and the African-American church is gonna be super duper important for the community, um, spoiler alert, after slavery is eliminated too. African-American culture included songs that had subtext that sometimes uh, masters didn't understand, like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot was a song to tell people that the Underground Railroad would be um, facilitating escape for those who wanted to make that journey. There were all kinds of stories told about animals who had been smarter than the people who wanted to oppress them, people like Br'er, uh, animals like Br'er Rabbit. Um, this idea of telling stories about animals that are really stories about problem solving was an African custom. And then finally, they spoke in dialects that were a mixture of English, standard English as spoken by the plantation owners, and African languages. And a kind of Creole that was sometimes hard for plantation owners to understand. Plantation owners chalked it up to, oh, our enslaved workers are stupid. But the enslaved people understood that if they could keep plantation owners from knowing what they were talking about, they would be able to have more space for themselves. So all of these cultural factors are part of what we might call the world the enslaved made. So you should be able to see the PowerPoint. Let me get to where I was. Okay, this is the last page that I talked about on Tuesday. And my point on this page was to talk about the things that historians have described, the ways in which um, enslaved people managed to carve out a kind of sphere of autonomy for themselves. I should say that this is very much a changing historiography. Historiography means historical writing. And historiography changes over time depending on who is in the historical profession, who's writing about various different topics, and what kinds of sources are they looking at. So for a long time, the history of you know, writing about slavery, it was mo mostly Southerners who were employed as historians. It was mostly white people, almost overwhelmingly white people. And they were mainly looking at slaveholder records. So it was not until the 1960s and 1970s when more African-American scholars entered the field that you started to get people looking at sources that had been generated by enslaved people themselves. So they started looking at things like folklore and songs and slave narratives that were published by the Works Progress Administration uh, during the Great Depression. And these things kind of sketched out aspects of the lives of enslaved people that had not been known about before or not been focused on before. Now, how did people who were enslaved kind of resist the 
oppression of the workplace. Um, there were what I would call everyday resistance. And then there were more major acts of resistance. There were kinds of resistance that you could do on a daily basis. And if you were lucky, the overseer wouldn't notice, the master wouldn't notice. Stealing food, for example, from the kitchen, if you were the cook. Working slowly to regulate the workload. Um, slave owners complained all the time in their correspondence and in their own record books about the laziness of enslaved people. And reading between the lines, you know, historians think a lot of this so-called laziness was strategic to regulate their work since they weren't getting paid for it. The destruction of property, breaking tools, mistreating animals. Singing songs that were meant to encourage resistance or to inform people about the Underground Railroad. There was a thing called running away nearby where people would go off into nearby woods for a few days as a way of kind of taking a break from the unremitting toil of the plantation. Sometimes enslaved people were able to take physical revenge on their masters. One young woman who I read about was constantly mistreated by the master's wife. But when the mistress of the plantation had a stroke, the young enslaved woman, instead of like swatting flies away from her, used to hit the paralyzed women, woman in the face with a fan. Harriet Jacobs in, I think the longer version of her memoir, I'm not sure that it's in the one that you're reading, described another instance of a nurse who snuck into a baby nurse, that is somebody who nurses babies, um, was snuck into the room where um, a white woman's dead body was laid out before burial and slapped the corpse on the face. Unfortunately for her, the young white baby that she was toting around uh, had just learned how to talk and said what she had seen happen. And so the um, young enslaved woman was sold to the South as a form of punishment sold to a plantation further south. Um, you can see right here a reward. Um, these kinds of uh, runaway slave classified ads appeared in newspapers all over the south during this period. They're interesting for historians to read, not just because they tell us something about slavery, which is that enslaved people ran away, but also about what people looked like, what kind of possessions and clothing they had with them, what kinds of scars they had, how they might present themselves. Okay. A more ambitious kind of running away was running away to the north. Lots of people, in fact, did this. You're going to read about how Harriet Jacobs managed it. Of course, some of the people used the Underground Railroad, which as you know, was not a railroad at all, but a series of safe houses that connected the South, the Deep South, to the North and all the way up into Canada. Friendly white and black residents would hide enslaved people who were on the run and, you know, do a lookout for when it was safe enough for them to be transported to the next stop on the so-called Underground Railroad. There were some pretty creative and famous ways that enslaved people escaped to the North. 
What you're looking at there in the cartoon is a depiction of Henry Box Brown. Box was not really his middle name, but it was his nickname. He had had some friends mail him to the north in a crate. So he was all squished down into this crate. It had a couple of air holes. It was a very small crate. He had himself sent to the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society and they opened the box and there he was. One wouldn't have thought it would be possible to travel for a couple of days in a tiny box like this, but um, a few years ago, a young man uh, repeated the same, um, the same endeavor, you know, just to kind of get a sense of what it was like for Henry Box Brown. And he was quite, you know, cramped and uncomfortable, but showed that yes, indeed, it was possible for somebody to do this. Another example of people kind of really using a clever method to run away to the north. There was a couple and the woman of this married couple was very light skinned, light enough to pass for white. Her husband was a lot darker. And so they escaped to the north using regular means of transportation, like going on a, a steamboat up the Mississippi. However, she pretended to be a, a sick white man. So she had bandaging over her hand and around her mouth um, so that she wouldn't be expected to talk or to write her name. And her husband uh, pretended to be the white man's valet you know, black servant, and they managed to get uh, away to the north by, you know, dressing and disguise in this way. Questions so far? Uh, yes, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is there any evidence that uh, slaves who ran away tried to, to try to start their own community within the South instead of going North or like, uh, I'm, I lived in Georgia for a while and there, you have Goladichi tribes and off the Pillow Island and other tribes off the islands of South Carolina. And now do they try to make their own community or were they just trying to escape to where there was more freedom for, for white men? Well, um, enslaved people in the deep South, one of the things that they could do was to try to get to Southern Florida and unite with the Seminole Indians. The Seminole Indians of Florida, basically a tribe comprised of Native Americans and runaway enslaved people. So that was a possibility. But any place that was sort of within, within the territorial limits of the United States and not controlled by Anglos, you know, the number of places that were like that were pretty small. So most of them were trying to get north. The problem was the further south you were, the harder it was to get away from a plantation full stop. As soon as you left a plantation, there were uh, what were called patrollers or night riders, actually the forerunners of today's police, whose job it was to ride around the south looking for African Americans who were out without a pass. If you wanted to go anywhere as a enslaved person in the South. You needed to have a written pass from your master. If not, you could be whipped, you could be jailed, you could be lynched. Um, and this was one of the reasons why it was against the law to teach enslaved people how to read and write. Because, you know, passes could be forged, enslaved people could find out about things from the newspapers. So um, there was really an attempt to keep people as um, hemmed in as possible. It's a good question though. Thank you. Sure. Now there were slave insurrections in the South, but they are relatively rare. Um, the first one uh, that we know of in the Lower South happened in 1704, then there was one in 1722, there was one in 1800. Um, these Insurrections or attempted insurrections tended to be found out about before they even happened, or if they did happen, there would be, you know, massive um, 
corporal or capital punishment of the people who participated. The most famous revolt occurred in Virginia in August 1831. It was Nat Turner's rebellion. And Nat Turner was an enslaved man who could read and write. He had done a lot of reading of the Bible. He was kind of a, a part-time preacher and very much a believer in the notion that he had kind of a prophetic line to God. So he had a vision that he needed to do an insurrection to free the enslaved people of the county that he lived in, Hampton County, Virginia. He was waiting for a sign from God. Um, the moon looked a particular way one evening, and he considered that to be his sign from God. So with this religion, religious vision in his mind, he and about 60 other slaves uh, went around to the houses in South Hampton County, Virginia, in the middle of the night and killed 55 white people. They would not have been stopped were it not for the fact that one young man, like who was a teenager, managed to run away in his nightshirt to the nearest county seat and to raise the alarm and then a bunch of, you know, white vigilantes came in and captured everybody. Turner managed to escape, but was found two months later hiding in the brush. This rebellion was followed by a couple of different things. First of all, there was a trial. Anybody who was clearly a planner of Nat Turner's rebellion, uh, was uh, executed. However, um, recompense was paid to the slave owners because this represents destruction of their property. Some African Americans who were thought not to be in on the planning stages were just disciplined by whipping and returned to their masters. But there was a reign of terror against free and enslaved Blacks throughout Southampton County, Virginia, because it was thought that it was really impossible for enslaved African Americans to want to rebel. So they must have been egged on by free African Americans. So the vigilantes went into people's homes and they just like threw all the stuff all over the place, took any books that they found confiscated um, any kind of ammunition or weapons, restricted the movements of free African Americans. They debated briefly whether they should get rid of slavery in Virginia, whether slavery was a threat to white lives of the magnitude that it was really important to end it. But it was decided to not do that that it was sort of too late to um, outlaw slavery in Virginia. And so they passed a series of laws that um, made it even more punishable to educate enslaved people. And if they were, enslaved people were barred from gathering for any reason without a white person present. Free blacks were not allowed to carry guns not allowed to serve in the militia, not allowed to purchase slaves. And lest you're wondering, why would any black person want to purchase slaves? This was often how people freed their family members, was by getting enough resources to purchase them. Okay. So there were a whole series of ways in which African Americans who were enslaved kind of pushed back against the oppression of their working conditions, living conditions. However, no, they really didn't have too many options because it was a very, very closed system in the South. Finally, what was the impact of slavery on Southern development. 
Well, first of all, um, the debate about slavery was stifled in the South. Slavery was so important to the economy of the South that there really couldn't be a debate on getting rid of it because nobody knew what to do with the enslaved African Americans. What this meant in practice was that any material related to the abolition of slavery was barred from the South. Um, the Postal Service would not allow such material to go through the mails. Um, newspapers that tried to publish anything in favor of the abolition of slavery could find their presses attacked, set on fire, uh, their editors killed. One of the most important aspects of the stifled debate, Congress actually passed a rule called the gag rule saying that any petitions that came into the House or Senate on the subject of uh, abolishing slavery could not be discussed. That was like the one part of freedom of speech that congressmen and senators didn't even have because broaching this topic was too dangerous. Uh, another impact of slavery on Southern development was that there was real, there continued to be real social stratification among white people in the South. Uh, what I said to you a while ago when we first discussed slavery in here, I think it was uh, lecture four, um, the vast majority of slaves were owned by just the very top 10% of the population in the South. These were the plantation owners, they were also the politicians, they were the ones who could afford to have their children educated. Uh, below that, a thin stratum of yeoman farmers who owned their own land and might have one or two slaves working alongside the family in the fields. And then below that, the poorest white people at the bottom of the social ladder didn't have any land, didn't have any enslaved people. They were maybe squatting on some land that they didn't own, or they were working for somebody else. But what separated them from African Americans was their skin color. And so at least they could kind of enjoy the so-called wages of whiteness as W.E.B. Du Bois referred to it, the privileges and benefits that came from being a white man in a racist society. Their self-respect in a large part hinged on the existence of slavery or hinged on the existence of a group that was lower than them on the social ladder. So you can see now why, even though you know, at least 50% of the Southern white population didn't own slaves. They had a stake in the continuation of slavery. So white supremacist beliefs were a crucial aspect of this whole economic system in the South. Um, and as we're gonna see in the very last lecture, in this uh, class, those white supremacist beliefs become sort of an infrastructure of a post-war, post-slavery settlement in the South. But even before the Civil War, there is a real lack of economic diversification. Um, people did not want to build factories in the South. They did not want to build railroads that connected cities. There might be railroads that connected plantations to markets, but there were not, they weren't concerned about building up an urban infrastructure in the South. In contrast, the North was much more economically diverse. But if you had a lot of money in the South, what you wanted to buy was more land and more enslaved people, because that supported a, an aristocratic lifestyle to which white, wealthy Southerners had become accustomed. 
Okay. Questions or comments about this? Okay. Um, where was Matt Turner's rebellion? It was in Southampton County, Virginia. Southampton? Yep. I believe the county seat of that county is Jerusalem. So look at a map. How many white men died there? Um, 55 white people were killed. It was men, women, and children. They really did not uh, distinguish on the basis of age or gender. The point was just to wipe everybody out. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. All right, moving on. Let's 